Hi, everyone. Welcome to Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast, where I share lesson ideas, songs, games, and inspiring things for your elementary music classroom. My name is David Rao, and I am the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. This episode of the podcast is a replay containing the audio version of a Musical Mondays live video. If you're not familiar with Musical Mondays, every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I go live on Facebook and Instagram to share about the lessons that I'm using in class with my students. I give a recap of my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons and then do a deep dive about one grade level and share the books, instruments, songs, and process that I use to teach the lesson to kids. This podcast episode contains all the audio from the Musical Mondays video, but if you'd like to see a replay of the video itself, you can find a link to the archived video on YouTube when you click the link in the notes for this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here's the show. Hi everyone, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, um, on YouTube, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao, or for Make Moments Matter Music Education. Um, I'm so excited to be sharing with you this week a little bit about um, some ideas for December. Um, I know it is the week of Thanksgiving, um, but a couple weeks ago I started sharing about Thanksgiving ideas. Um, and uh, you know, I know that people like to plan ahead and think a little bit ahead. So I'm going to be sharing some of the the resources and ideas and things that I use in December. Uh, so you can get sort of a jump on that planning and start thinking ahead, um, to the weeks ahead. I'm also sharing about December because this is actually the last video I'm going to be doing for the fall semester. It's the 15th video I've done, um, this fall. And so it feels like a really good, uh, place to stop, um, just for a break and I'll be back in January. January. Um, So because of that, um, I'm planning ahead. I'm going to share a little bit about December so that you can get some of those ideas if you're interested. Um, If you've been watching these last 15 weeks, thank you so much for coming along um, and uh, joining in the conversation and, and, um, and sharing along with me. I really appreciate that. If you've been listening on the podcast, I appreciate you for taking the time to do that. Um, If you've watched or if you've been on the podcast, um, if you are willing, um, I have a a very quick survey with just a few questions about um, how you listen, um, if what you're hearing is helpful, what you'd like to hear more about. Um, It's a very, very, very quick survey. It'll take you less than two minutes. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer. Um, And if you do that survey, there is a free gift for you at the end just for completing the survey because you would not believe how many times I've done a survey and nobody does it. So if you are willing, to do that survey after this video is over. There's a link on the links page. I'd really appreciate that. Um, So let me get started. I'm going to be sharing about just some lessons that you might be able to use in December, some of the resources and ideas that could go along with that. Um, And then at the end, um, there's uh, the quick survey I'll give you, but also there uh, might be a giveaway coming. So I'll just talk about that at the end. But um, like I said, this is fall semester and, and thanks so much for coming along with me these last 15 weeks. So I wanted to start by just sharing um, some ideas that you could, uh, well, to encourage you to think outside of the box. I feel like so many people get uh, shoved into like, well, I've got to do these lessons in December um, or, you know, like I've got to do this lesson with sleigh bells because they hear those in December or I've got to do this lesson I've always done. Feel free to do whatever you want. Um, I know some people uh, do a more traditional route if you work at a um, a parochial school or you work at a Christian school maybe you do um, carols that they're gonna sing in Christmas programs maybe you're just overloaded with a huge Christmas program that or a winter program or whatever it is you do at your school and a lot of people feel very pigeonholed in December like I've got to get these lessons in well there are a lot of really cool resources you can use to help teach some of those lessons maybe in a different way um, or maybe some things that you would maybe not normally use that you're that you want to try now so let me just show you a couple things that you might consider um, and a couple of these lessons I'm going to show you a couple different ways to get at them so hope that's helpful this first one um, is a book that I found um, it's actually part of a series um, it's called the snowman shuffle and I wrote down who the author was and then I I put that on the links page and it's actually not on the book except very small in the back written by Christiane Jones illustrated by Emma Randall um, and there's a whole set of, of books like this that are just perfect for movement 
This one is the Snowman Shuffle. There's also the Reindeer Dance, the Santa Shimmy, and the Elf Boogie. But I wanted to show you this one really quick. Um, so the Snowman Shuffle, um, it's a board book, um, but you could absolutely enlarge it if you had a, a document camera or uh, you know had another way to enlarge it to show students if you wanted it for a larger class. Shuffle like a snowman, shuffle side to side. And that seems pretty obvious because like a, you could have talked to kids like, how would a snowman move? Well, a snowman can't walk right? Because they don't have legs. So you sort of have to shuffle or, or shimmy or something. Shuffle forward, shuffle backward in a graceful slide. And if I had not interrupted, it would say shuffle like a snowman, shuffle side to side, shuffle forward, shuffle backward in a graceful slide. Rub your hands together. Keep them nice and warm. Spin like a snowflake in a winter storm. You might have a quick conversation about, does a, a snowman really want to rub his hands together to stay warm? Probably not. And why? <laughs> that might be a fun conversation to have. Swoosh like the wind on a cold winter day. Move like a tree branch. Sway, sway, sway. Hop, 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 hop all around. Now stop and be still. You are frozen to the ground. Then tip your hat, take a frosty bow. Look at you, you're a snowman now. And that's the end of the book. I think it's really, really cute and cool, but I love a couple of things about it. I love that it uses all these different movement words. Um, it gives all of these different ideas about how to be a snowman because some kids are like, oh, snowman, well, you gotta stand just this certain way. Well, let's get someone to think about a snowman. If a snowman could move, how would a snowman move? Um, I especially love this page in the hop. You can sort of see the snowman is hopping apart. <laughs> he's, uh, he's hopped, so now he's in um, three different big balls, and he's uh, just sort of moving around with space in between. I think that's sort of silly, but I think kids are really going to like it, and I love that it does get them moving and interacting in sort of different ways, um, and it gives you a chance to talk about snowman. It gives you a chance to use something that's maybe holiday, or not holiday, uh, seasonal, um, but maybe not holiday related. If you your school doesn't mind using Santa or reindeer or elves, you could do the other versions because like I said, there's uh, the reindeer dance, the Santa shimmy, and the elf boogie. You could use one of those and then bring the snowman shuffle um, out in January or February if you wanted. Um, I'm planning to bring the snowman shuffle in in December because one of the things that I generally do a second grade is of course, a book I set out set far away, um, Frosty the Snowman. And I use this version of the book uh, by Steve Nelson and Jack Rollins, illustrated by Richard Caudry. I use this book. I shared about it several weeks ago, um, but it's it's just a great book with lots of wonderful illustrations. And I have a whole blog post on my blog about how you can infuse critical thinking into your snowman, um, Frosty the Snowman lesson to make it more than just um, the song. You can make it, it more interesting where um, you really do talk about, well, what do you see in the picture that made him come to life? How can you tell? You know, you can, you can see a lot more than just, you can do a lot more than just sing the song, although you could really just sing the song if you're interested. But um, like I said, the snowman shuffle would be really great to pair with um, Frosty the Snowman. If you're interested, it would be a nice little connection point in there. Okay, let's see. Um... Nope. Okay. If anyone is leaving a comment or question, I'm sorry for some reason I still can't see them this week. So really sorry about that. But I appreciate if you're leaving comments or questions or ideas for other folks um, to, uh, as you listen, that's, oh, I always appreciate when people leave questions and comments because it means that you're, um, you know, not just watching me sitting here in my office. You're just interacting as, as a community. And I love that. So sorry um, if I if you're asking things that I can't tell. Um, the links for the Snowman Shuffle and Frosty the Snowman are both on the links page. And um, if you don't know how to find that, at the bottom of the caption for this video is a link to that links page. And if you're on Instagram, if you go to my link in profile, there's a link to the links page too. Um, and it's the Musical Mondays recap page. And it has all the links to the things that I've talked about. So if you like that book, it's a great book to have. Um, and really, it'd be simple to integrate with Frosty the Snowman or on its own, or just a nice sort of movement break in the beginning beginning or middle or end of your class, it'd be uh, so simple to add that in, then flow into a lesson about movement. Um, or I know a lot of people do the 
um, ice skating lesson where you take paper plates and you skate around the room and you and use those to sort of slick up the movement that you could do that if you wanted but it's a great book it's sort of a hook that would would bring them and take them to any other sort of lesson you might be interested in okay so another book that um, I just love and have fallen in love with recently that I plan to use this year um, is this book called Tus Noche Buena. It's a Christmas story in English and Spanish, and it's written by Roseanne Greenfield Thong, illustrated by Sarah uh, Palacios. Palacios, probably. Um, but I wanted to just share this one with you because it's a very interesting book, and um, I'm going to try my best in the Spanish pronunciation. It's been uh, high school or senior year in high school since I've really, really. Uh, use Spanish, but I'm going to um, share the best I can. Twas noche buena, and all through our casa, every creature is needing tamale masa. For one of our holiday tradiciones is making tamales, not one, but montones. And every last person, both chicas and chicos, is needed to make our tamales taste ricos. We stuff them with pollo, with queso, and meat, and steam them in corn husks and leaves. What a treat. Also, I love that this boy right in front of his mom is trying to steal something from the, <laughs> the sweet jar. Good try, kid. Our lovely adornos are hung up with cheer in hopes that amigos soon will be here. Small figures of wise men, los reyes, and sheep, a tiny clay cama where baby can sleep. In the corner, an arbol that's covered with bells, twinkling luces, red ribbons, and shells. So for those of you who are, are following along and are like, I don't know these words, um, all these Spanish words are intermingled with the English words, and there is a glossary in the back in case you have kids who don't know or you want to stop in the middle of the story and explain. Because if you want to say, like, a cama is a bed or an arbol is a tree, I mean, if they don't get that from saying, like, in the corner, an arbol that's covered, covered with bells and twinkling luces, lights, red ribbons, and shells. If they don't get that from the text, um, you can always point out, or you can have in the back, you can have that glossary that, you're, that you can translate. When our guests all arrive, we stroll down to the park and join the posadas that start when it's dark. With homemade faroles that glow in the light, we sing canciones by soft candlelight. And this is cool because this is retelling um, Las Posadas. It's explaining Las Posadas, which is um, a tradition that a lot of um, Spanish-speaking countries take part in, um, but one that maybe some of our kids will know and maybe some won't. But it's a great one to talk, to talk about, especially if you want to start including more uh, world culture and you want to include um, non-Christmas holiday traditions in your December lessons. Because a lot of our kids know some of the Christmas traditions but don't know others. From casa to casa, parading we go, remembering stories from days long ago. Le pido posada is our humble plea. Can you offer a shelter? We ask, hopefully. The first two houses do not agree, but the very last house will always say, see. Si. Then back to our family fiesta we race to snuggle up closely by the brick fireplace and treat all our shivering invitados to warm mugs of chocolatey puerado. We clink our glass marbles and play loteria while singing and laughing, gay marvaria. We sing out, or sorry, when out in the jardin, I hear such a clatter. I spring from my silla to shout, what's the matter? The children are cheering below a great star. A brilliant piñata made out of a jar. Come Sonia, come Alma, Luis, and Martin. It is time for our favorite games to begin. Dale, dale, hit it, they cry. Uno, dos, tres, now it's our try. A shower of candy soon falls to El Suelo. We chase after gum and sweet caramelo. Or caramelo, caramelo. Obviously, you have to preview these words if you're going to read it and with the Spanish words. Then off in the distance, campanas chime, telling us all that it is nearly time. For Misa del Gallo, our mass late at night, with Gallo, sorry, Misa del Gallo, our mass late at night, with candles aglow, it's a beautiful sight. We sing all our favorite canciones with choirs of angels up in balcones. And when it is over, we get a surprise. As colorful fireworks paint the night skies. 
Then back to our houses we happily run, knowing our Santa has finally begun, with pots full of grandmother's steaming pozole and sauce for our turkey, a treat we call mole. And just when we've eaten as much as we can, we hear a loud sizzle from grandmother's pan. The children all cheer as they wait for their treat, buñuelos with cinnamon sugar, so sweet. With satisfied bellies and sleepy eyes, we head to the sala for one last surprise. Giggling and cheering, we dash for the tree, where regalos are waiting for you and for me. We open our cards that were chosen with care as long strands of cinta fly out everywhere. A smile from Papi, a kiss from a friend, and many abrazos that don't seem to end. Now our friends are all tired from fun and fiesta. It's time to go home for a long night's siesta. Merry Christmas, they cheer as they head out of sight. Feliz Navidad, and to all, a good night. So I think that is just a really beautiful book. Um, I love reading in the back. Um, the author note says, uh, last noche buena, I went in search of tamales for my Christmas dinner, but had arrived too late. My local restaurants were sold out. I had experienced the warmth and beauty of this tradition while living in Guatemala and Mexico. Now, how would I share it with my daughter? Suddenly a playful rhyme about tamales started dancing in my head like the famous sugar plums of Clement Clark Moore. Visions of tamales turned into visions of buñuelos, piñatas, posadas, and more. The result is Twas Noche Buena, a picture book that reimagines a beloved Christmas text Twas the Night Before Christmas. So it's just a really super cool book um, that I think you could integrate so well. If you do any lesson on Twas the Night Before Christmas, this would be like an amazing extension. Um, if you talk at all about Las Posadas, um, the tradition that happens um, in many Spanish-speaking countries, this would be a, a great extension. If you just want to integrate a little bit more um, uh, you know, different world cultures. If you want to make a connection to different people around the world, this would be a great connection. Um, the book's not all that expensive. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it in um, some used bookstores. Um, it's not very old. It was put out in 2014, so there are not as many copies as maybe some other books that are out, but it's a, a great book to have. And like I said, there's a glossary of Spanish terms in the back. So if you're like, mm, what's an abrazo? Even though you can sort, I mean, this is so hilarious because it, it, it's like, um, English language learners, we expect them to understand, or or, e, or even ELA strategies, we expect students to understand new vocabulary based on context clues and things that happen in the sentence or pictures that we give them. And so as, as I was reading through this for the first time, I knew a lot of the vocabulary, but there are some words I didn't. And I was like, man, what? And then I realized like, well, maybe I should figure out what words come before and after the word I don't know and what pictures are on the page. And maybe that'll help me understand. But if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, um, you can look back here in the back and it gives some of the answers. It doesn't have a pronunciation guide, uh, but you can find a lot of those pronunciations on um, websites. You can ask a Spanish speaking friend. Um, but you know, I, I always, well, and also it rhymes, the book rhymes. So a lot of times you can sort of guess based on the other words, uh, what it's supposed to sound like. Um, I know I don't do all the words exactly perfectly. My pronunciation isn't exact. Um, but I think that it's better to try and fail than to just dismiss the book because, oh, I might get some words wrong. And you know, what's really funny is that some of these words, when I, not this specific book, cause I, I got it this year and I haven't used it with students yet, but, um, other times when I use books like uh, My Name is Celia, when I did Celia Cruz uh, for Hispanic Heritage Month, or um, the book about Tito Puente, when I when I use those words and there are Spanish speakers in the room, if I get something wrong, they'll usually giggle and then they'll correct me, but not in like a mean way, like, oh, you're so dumb. They'll be like, ha ha, no, but this is it, Mr. Rao, thanks so much. And, then, and they'll, they'll help me along. So I think it's worth it, it even if you're a little bit self-conscious you're probably going to be reading this in front of eight-year-olds, so they're not going to judge you, but they are going to appreciate that you're, you're bringing out a book that represents them and represents their culture or expands their worldview. And so, um, like I said, this is a Twas Noche Buena by Roseanne Greenfield Thong, illustrated by Sarah Palacios. Um, and 
and it does touch on Las Posadas. Um, it, like when they went through the street, you could sort of see it happening um, where, you know, they say they go from house to house and it's the third house that welcomes them in. Um, that's a Las Posadas tradition. Um, there are a lot of other really fun traditional things that are um, like the bunuelos that they make or the piñata. So you're bringing in all these great traditional elements. You could have some of those in your classroom. I usually try and bring in um, piñatas to have in the room. Um, so you could have pictures up on um, the computer so you could show students some of the foods or some of the other traditions. There are some really cool videos that explain Las Posadas. You could have all of those ready to go if you wanted to do an extension on this lesson. Um, if you're going to teach I don't know, Feliz Navidad, or if you're going to do, um, you know, some sort of movement activity to, to a lesson like that, that'd be great. For my third graders, I thought I could read this book and then pull out um, the dance we did to Los Machetes a few weeks ago for a family folk dance night. I thought that'd be a sort of a fun connection. Um, but whatever you do, I think it's worth bringing in this book. It's a really beautiful book. And um, like I said, it's it's just so much fun to do. And it's also would be a great connection if you did teach Twas the Night Before Christmas or anything sort of like that because it, it is very reminiscent of that and follows that rhyme structure. So um, the link for that book is also on the links page in case you want to get on Amazon or you want to get it uh, the ISBN from Amazon and then go to your favorite used books uh, website and find it there. My favorite book websites, um, Amazon, you, you can get some things really cheap there and it comes very quick. Um, there's betterworldbooks.com. That's probably my very favorite because they ship books for free and they're in great condition. Um, often used, but usually in a great condition. Thriftbooks.com, abebooks.com, and bookoutlet.com are all great book websites that you could check out. Book Outlet is the one um, that is really cool because you can get brand new copies of things. Uh, for instance, if um, uh, a regional bookstore bought too much of a certain thing, they might sell it off and Book Outlet will take those copies and then sell brand new copies at discount prices. The one thing I'd say about Book Outlet, unlike the other sites I mentioned, is it takes like two to three weeks to ship because they do not take the fast shipping route. They go the cheap shipping route and they're not super duper fast in the warehouse. So um, maybe don't get this book for the ho for if you're going to plan on using it in December because you may have to wait until the last week of December. But um, get book outlet you can use for future things. It's a great book website to use. Okay, um, so those are just two, book, or two books that you could use in your classroom that are great um, and two different aspects of things you could use in your classroom in December. Um, I want to talk about um, Otanenbaum. I teach that every year to my students um, and I, I love it because um, it again brings in another different tradition. It brings in something different into the classroom. It explains an element for something that students might see, um, a Christmas tree or, a, you know, a pine tree um, and or fir tree or, you know, whatever they're going to see. It explains some of that and gives them a little context. It brings in a little bit of foreign language. Um, I use the lesson to talk about form, um, but there are so many things you can do with it. So, um, when I talk to students um, about this song, I say, oh, I got this really great song. Um, and you you probably know exactly what it means. Um, and it goes like this. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, wie treu sind deine Blätter. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, wie treu sind deine Blätter. And that's, I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry if the pronunciation's wrong, but um, just I'm <laughs> remembering from years gone by. Um, and usually the kids are like looking at me very confused and I say, you do, you do know what that means, don't you? And they're like, no, it's like, oh, you, you don't speak this language. What, what language is this anyway? And it's fun to, to take them through and sort of see if they can guess what it is. Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum. And most of them are like, no, we don't, we don't know that. <laughs> so, um, it's fun to talk a little bit about another language, about German in this case. Um, and then it's fun to talk about what we're talking about because um, kids a lot of times will sing, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. But Tannenbaum is not actually Christmas tree. So let me pull up the visual that I use with kids. I'll see if I can do this here. Um, pulling up my computer. This doesn't always work well. The videos don't always like to show this, but let's see. And it's going to be backwards. I'm sorry because of 
Um, I, I'm using my FaceTime camera. But I, whenever I'm teaching something new where I'm gonna give a little bit of context, I try and pull up visuals and things that help students get more context. So this is um, a favorite folk song set that I created several years ago. Um, and I just use it to give a little bit more context about the song. It has a title page that just says O Tannenbaum, our favorite carol of the month. And because I know that some people use you know, these resources in different ways. Uh, for this one, there are a couple title pages, favorite folk or favorite carol of the month, favorite carol of the week. Um, if you want to use a Christmas tree instead of a Tannenbaum, there's that option. Um, or if you just want a other title slide, but sometimes it's nice to have just as a general title thing to put up um, as kids walk in or if you're giving them sort of a hook on the screen for them to know what's coming next. And then this this slide might look confusing, but it I also often use these sets as bulletin boards. So this one you could cut out and put, you know, K1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, um, if that's like the, the grade level that's focusing on that, but that's if you wanted to use this as a bulletin board. There's a whole slide about what is a carol, um, and because I think that you know you could talk about well a carol is a specific kind of a song it's a festive song um, it has a seasonable a seasonal subject oftentimes it's danceable and so that gives you a little bit of context if you want to talk about carols in general um, and then I talk about where the song comes from I think it's so important if you're going to talk about something from around the world to give the kids context about where like literally physically where it comes from because so many of my students have such a cursory knowledge of the world and of maps and of where things are um, that if, you know, say like, oh, it's from another country and they're like, oh, like Alabama. I'm like, no, <laughs> not like Alabama. Oh, like Kentucky. Well, no. I mean, <laughs> to, to you as a third grader, you might feel like that is a country away. But actually, no, I'm talking about something far, 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 far away over an ocean. Uh, and so it's fun. It's fun to give that context to kids. So then we actually jump into what a Tannenbaum is. Well, I, I do give them another, you know, slide of like, well, it's it has very many, lots and lots of versions, but you could trace the original first one written down to 1550, which is very, very, very old. Um, and so again, they don't really have a lot of context about that. But when I, I, I do sing the song through a couple times and then I start talking about uh, the origins and it's a while until we, Sorry, it's a while until we um, actually get back to singing as students, but I think it's worth taking the time um, to to actually talk about what this is. Sorry, I'm Facebook, I'm having a hard time getting you to be able to see that. So um, I talk about, you know, Germany and what it's like to be in Germany in the winter and how dark and sort of dreary it can get. And, you know, the, the sun is only out for a few hours every day and, uh, you know, all the leaves come off the trees and it's dark and dreary and people are wearing their coats and they're all bundled up and it's very cold. And so when they're walking around, you know, they, they sort of look down at the ground and they see dirty snow and they see, you know, their boots and it's just, oh, it's such a dreary time. Well, um, what the Germans many, many years ago realized was that even out in this very dreary time, there was something that was bright and green and exciting. And it was a, a special tree that grew in the forest. And even if there was snow or sludge or whatever, it still was a bright green. Even when all the other trees had lost their leaves, this tree had not. And that was the Tannenbaum, which is um, a tree that, you know, when everything else is dark and dreary, it is still green which is why we oftentimes call this kind of a tree an evergreen tree because it is always green, even when other things are not. And so, uh, you know, we could talk about how actually it was a, a fir tree um, and the words uh, Tannenbaum actually translate to fir tree or evergreen tree. They don't translate to Christmas tree because the Tannenbaum tradition is actually older than the Christmas tree tradition. We actually get into that too, but you could talk about vocabulary too. You know, what does lovely mean? Some kids don't really have a, a, a context for that. So giving them a little bit of information about what is what does it mean that something is lovely, um, that's sort of important too. But the Christmas tree tradition actually, and this is was interesting, um, in the 16th century, the Germans started dragging these trees inside um, and calling them paradise trees because they were trees that were green and beautiful even when everything else was dreary and gross. And so um, they, that was in the 16th century. And then a German princess married an English prince and became the queen of England. And it was Queen Victoria in 1848. Um, she, oh, sorry, I have that backwards. I'm sorry. Uh, an English queen married a German uh a German man, and so Queen Victoria, who was British, I'm so sorry for all of you people who are freaking out out there, 
Um, she encouraged her German husband to decorate um, a tree in the palace. And so then the English started calling it a Christmas tree because it happened around Christmas. Uh, but the original tradition is not a Christmas tree, but a paradise tree. Um, and that was even, you know, preempted by the Tenenbaum, just bringing that in because of the beautiful tree. So the Christmas tree itself really didn't come in until late in the game. So this song is, uh, you know, if the if the tradition in, in England of calling it a Christmas tree happened in 1848, well, the song is from 1550. So the song is about 300 years older than the Christmas tree tradition. So that's, I just give all that as sort of a context to my students because, oh, and then, then there's um, sheet music if you need it, there's lyrics pages if you, um, if you kids to read it um, for verses one, two, and three. And then I also have the German right next to the English version in case you want um, students to see that uh, connection. And some vocab words if you want, flashcards, and then a, a picture of a, a person pruning a fir tree. Well, I, I always bring out that context because I want, ooh, sorry, that's really, now my video is too close. Um, I want students to know the context of what Tannenbaum is because I want them to know when we start singing the song because some kids are like oh it's a Christmas thing well no not really not originally and so it's sort of fun to give that context to kids um, and to give them a, an explanation of that let me see if I can close this out sorry because I think that you know when we're talking about uh, words and context it's good to give them a little bit of history about the song so what do I do with the song um, well we do learn Tannenbaum um, but we don't do any of the other German. It's just the Tannenbaum that we do in German. So um, I teach them uh, usually phrase by phrase. Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum, how lovely are your branches? Because lovely again was one of our vocabulary words. Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum, how lovely are your branches? And one of the other great things about the song is the range. It is wide. So I wait until about third grade to do this song. Um, if you do a unit on lo, so, do, this is a great one because it goes, oh, ten and bum, so, do, do, do. So it's a great, um, it's a great song for that if you wanted to reinforce so, do. Um, I also love it because um, then the, the bridge, the B section of the song goes up a little bit higher in the range. So, oh, you could talk about form to how it repeats itself and it goes in beauty green will always grow through summer sun and winter snow oh tannenbaum oh tannenbaum how lovely are your branches so you could talk about you could definitely talk about form in this song um a a b a if you wanted if you wanted to classify it as that um, but you in that da 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 with the kids' voices, that is high. And so um, to give them a chance um, to try that out uh, it is great. It expands them up a little bit. It puts them in their head voice. Um, but it's also just a, a, a great chance for them to explore a little bit up a little higher in their range. Because some kids are uncomfortable with it. But in the context of this song, it's not super uncomfortable. So then we add in... Um, we add in some actions. So for O Tannenbaum, um, I say when you do O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, you need to cr turn yourself into a Tannenbaum. You're gonna become a Tannenbaum. And so when they do that, it's hilarious to see some kids will do like, you know, a triangle shape with their hands. Sorry, let me see. Me, like a triangle shape with their hands down at their sides, like pointing out um, to try and be the Tannenbaum. That's always funny. Some kids decide like they need to put their hands above their head to make sort of a point to be a Tannenbaum. But whatever you have, whatever kids decide to do, you know, I show them the shape of that tree and they always know that it's like, well, you can't be a big, you know, like deciduous tree. It's a different kind of a tree. The evergreen tree looks different. So to get them to make that shape is fun. Um, and so then for in beauty green will always grow through summer sun and winter snow, um, I let the kids come up with actions. And in that instance, I always do something along the lines of um, huh, for in beauty green will always grow. What can we do for that? Hmm, what do you, th what sort of an action could we do, you know, for growing? And some kid, maybe a kid will do like their hand sort of, you know, grow like the, sh like the action of what it would look like to maybe for a, a plant and time lapse to grow out of the ground. And I go, oh, wow, that's a really cool idea. Everyone try that. Oh, wow. Oh, that's wonderful. What else could we do? What else could be 
you know, in beauty green growing? What, could, what, what else could that look like? And it's fun to not just go with your very first answer because, uh, you know, when kids see that one answer, they're like, well, that's what it's got to be. But you can say, well, what else could it be? And I would encourage you to have a couple things, you know, ready to go in case they're like, we have no other ideas. Uh, you know, Juan had the only good idea and that's it. You know, so if you could say, hmm, in beauty, green would always grow. You could stand back and admire how beautiful it's being. Oh, in beauty, green will always grow. There it is. We're looking at it. Oh, it's so beautiful. It could be your whole body growing from the ground out of a seed. Let's see, what else could it be? And then going through a lot of different options. Sometimes I'll say like, hmm, which one should we choose? And then they'll decide or sometimes... Um, I'll just say like, oh, I love that. That was such a great, and everyone seemed to do that so well and it uses our level. So let's try that one. Um, but sometimes I'll just say, you know, you choose which, which of those options, those five options we came with, you choose the one you like the best and you do that option. What about the next phrase? In beauty green will always grow through summer sun and winter snow. What could that be? And you, someone might make like a big, make their hands into a sun and then do snow. One time I had one kid hold their hands up high like the sun and the kid next to them was like, like pretending to be hot. And then the, the first kid made snow and then the second kid went like they were cold, uh, mining the actions. That was fun. Um, there are so many different things you can do for this song if you want. Uh, but I love encouraging kids to come up with their own actions. So, but when we finish, then they have their A, A, B, A, and they have to act out those things as we sing it. And then I add one more part, or maybe the, in the first day we just stop there and the second time I add the extra part, but I'll just tell you about the extra part now. Um, the extra part is I add in an interlude, an instrumental interlude, and I break the class in half. And um, the first half uh, gets to, well, they have to be, Tannenbaum. So they have to stand stationary like a Tannenbaum. And the other half of the class walks around and admires how beautiful the trees are. And they'll go like, oh, oh, oh so green. Oh, ooh. you know, and they like walk. And I, I mime that so they can like see what that sort of silly thing looks like. They think it's funny and they think it's great. So the kids are like, oh, I had to be the trees. They're like, no, oh, I got to have this part. And the other kids like get to walk around and be silly. They think that's so hilarious. But we do that. We sing, and then we do that act, that set of actions, um, and they think that's great. Well, they say, okay, we're going to sing it one more time. So we sing it again, do what are the actions we learned, and then the second time, the second instrumental interlude, the kids who are admirers before have to become Tannenbaums. So I say, okay, so if you're walking around looking at the Tannenbaums, you have to become a Tannenbaum. So like, aha, oh, it's going to be so easy. So they stand and they do their Tannenbaum shape. And I say, and if you were Tannenbaums before and you had to be observed before, then now you get to do what the Germans did in, um, you know, 1550. You get to walk around, find your favorite Tannenbaum, chop it down and haul it inside and make it your, your paradise tree. And they're like, what? And I start playing. And so it's so hilarious to see the kids who were like standing so nice before, like going down, like chopping down the other kids and hauling them inside. And I have never had a kid like get, go too far with it. Like they, I've never had a kid get too crazy. They've gotten a little bit silly, but it's like they, you know, it's third graders in December. So like, that's what they're going to do. But, um, it's always just so funny to see that role reversal of the kid who had to be so standing, standing so stoic before like turning into a lumberjack. Um, but it's, it's just a fun way to add another element to the song that's already great and rife with possibilities. So, um, O Tannenbaum is really wonderful. Check it out if you haven't done that one before. And like I said, um, you can bring in some of the German text. You could teach more of the German text if you wanted to. Um, you could, um, yeah, and for me, it's it's easy because the only words in German that students have to learn is Tannenbaum. Oh, Tannenbaum. That's all they sing in German. The rest we do an English version of. But uh, you could do the whole first, first section in all German if you wanted. It's not that long and pretty repetitive. Um, but... But if you want, like I said, that that folk song set that I used that I ha that I showed you just a second ago, it gives a lot of that context. It gives images that kids can sort of latch onto, and it helps them to understand more of the context behind this tradition because it is a pretty famous song. It does come up quite a bit, uh, but kids don't always know why. They just think it's a Christmas tree song. Well, actually, originally it was not, and so I I love the 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 um, ability to take something that is so traditional and so. Um, ubiquitous that they understand and give it more context and give it a little bit more to help them understand and also to understand that like 
American thing. This originally belonged to other people in another, another time on the other side of the world. So how cool that we get to be a part of that tradition. But uh, it's not, you know, this thing, you know, it's, it's fun, just fun to get to switch it up and give them a little bit more context. Okay. So that's uh, Otenenbaum. Another one that I like to teach is the 12 Days of Christmas. Um, I like to teach it because it is a cumulative song, um, because it, it keeps adding and adding and adding. Again, it has um, so, so, do, 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 da, 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 it does um, expand the range a little bit more. But more than that, it, it, it asks them to do another musical thing. Before it was, you know, a, an expanded range and low so to do. Now um, it asks them to have a little bit more endurance, which is tricky for kids, but it asks, it, it really requires them to stretch out and do a much longer form song. We don't always get to that as often as we'd like. So it's, it's fun to bring that in. Um, one resource I'm going to use this year is this book, The 12 Days of Christmas by, uh, illustrated by Emma Randall. She illustrated actually The Snowman Shuffle, which I threw over there. Um, so she's done quite a few great books, but this one's nice. Um, it has um, some sort of fun characters in it, um, some great sort of simple decorations and versions of um, the normal uh, lyrics, the calling birds, the French hens, the turtle doves, the partridges, the... Um, the geese and all that. I love that when it um, gets to more humans in the frame that it has all different skin tones, um, all different representations so that kids can see themselves in the book, even though it does use the traditional lyrics. So it's, it's just a very, very fun book. And it's fun because if you use this, kids start to realize like, if they missed out that it's cumulative before, they won't miss out when they see all of these things smooshed into one page that there is a lot that needs to be, that there's a lot that's included with every uh, new verse. And the, the illustrations just are really, really wonderful. And then at the end, there's the true love. Oh, how exciting. So the book is really great if you're gonna use it for a younger group. You could just take the book and sing for them. Um, that could be the lesson in, in K1 or two, um, if you wanted to share this story with them. I usually do the 12 days of Christmas um, in fourth grade usually. Um, and the reason I do that is then because, well, it's a really fun one that they might already know. Usually my fourth graders have a winter that traditionally in my school, they're the ones who do like the winter musical. And that's usually in the last week of school. Um, so this is a fun, like days after the performance, what do you do? Well, this is a great one that um, you could do some really fun things with that when they come to your class, they're not like, oh, we got to sing that music again. You know, it's just something a little bit different and a little bit um, fresh. So using the book is a great visual. I wanted to show you one more visual for something I created a couple years ago. Um, and that is this PowerPoint. So again, I'm really sorry that the visuals are backwards because I'm using my FaceTime camera, but I hope you can sort of see still. Sorry, Instagram, I'm getting you moved over here. Okay, so the 12 days of Christmas, um, and this is something I put together a couple years ago, um, and it, sh it shows you here at the beginning, there are a couple different ways you can use it, but we're gonna go through those really quick. So um, you could use it with just this version with the text, on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. And I chose um, this version for my students because I wanted them to see what a partridge actually is. That is not a very common vocabulary word um, for any elementary grade, honestly, um, but it's, it's, not very common for them to know unless maybe they live out in the, the country what a partridge actually is other than to know it's a bird. They usually don't know what it looks like. So when I show this very first slide, especially after showing them a, you know slides with clip art to show them then an actual picture, I usually get some like, oh, and then we I have to stop for a second to explain what it is and to talk a little bit about it. Then they're prepped for the next time and they're really excited because they know there are more things that are gonna show up that are the actual images. So on the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge and a pear. And so it accumulates the slides too, so that they're seeing on, um, for each word um, that slide come back again. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three French hens, two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. My favorite is when you get to the calling birds 
because then they start to realize like, oh, this maybe won't be quite so serious because the, <laughs> the calming birds are, it's an image of two birds. Like it looks like they're yelling at the, <laughs> the other bird. So um, pretty fun to add that in uh, because, and then kids are like, no, it's yelling. It's like, well, what do you think a call looks like for a bird? You know, like, what do you, what do you think that means? And we could talk about calling voice or whatever, but um, it's just fun to bring that in. The five golden rings are again, golden rings. Um, I'm just going to zoom ahead, ahead here. Six hens, seven swans, eight maids of milking. This one I always get groans or like complaining sounds from because they are like, oh, what's happening? But then we talk about what a milking maid is and you know what that job was and why people used to actually have to do that. Now now they actually have ro robots that milk cows. Um, my, my dad lives on a farm in the a uh, person two or three farms down has a robotic dairy. Um, but, but in back in the day, um, they actually ha you know, had milking maids. My mom would always talk about how she would, when she was growing up, she had to go milk the cows. Um, and so, well, cause they lived on a dairy, but to, to show them this picture is real life. It's reality in it. And for a lot of kids, they don't understand where milk comes from. And so to give them that picture is sort of fun. And unless you have like drink soy milk, in which case, I don't know, milking maid, I don't know what that picture would look like. Um, <laughs> nine ladies dancing. Um, I chose a sort of a more traditional folk dance picture for that. Uh, 10 lords a leaping. I, I went with like, I don't know, what was the best leaping picture I could get. You can't really find a lot of those for that. So um, those, those gentlemen are leaping. Um, 11 pipers piping. And I did not go with a traditional pipe in this case because I wanted to you know, again, sort of shake it up. So when we get to this picture, kids sometimes question, and then we talk about one, usually one kid in every class knows like, oh, those are bagpipes. And then it's a little bit different. And then the 12 drummers drumming, again, I chose sort of a military drum picture for this. Um, although you could go with really anything else, but I like choosing photos that, that ex again, expand their uh, schema and expand what their knowledge base is. So to choose um, these men in, um, you know, a military garb to choose bagpipers, to choose uh, lords maybe from a different country. You should choose different kind of dancers. That's all in, in the efforts to try and get them to think a little bit differently about what those words might mean to give more context. There's an entire ver a version of this where it just uses the clip art um, in case you wanted to do that instead. Um, so that's an option for you. And with every picture, then I made sure that I got the exact number with the, the actual pictures before it was hard to find pictures of just four birds singing or just seven geese. But in this instance, since I'm actually the one creating, um, this slide, I was able to get all the correct numbers for the correct things. And I'm sorry if you use a different version for the 11s and the 12s than I do, but that's just the version that I went with. Okay, so the 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping, this is the last version. And then um, one thing again that I love to do to give more context, to give more, um, to, to enhance their schema, I, I did this. So for the, for the first, for the partridge, and this only works when you're in presentation mode. It doesn't work if you're, uh, if you're like on this, where you can just see the, the whole PowerPoint in its entirety. It only works if you hit present. At least that's what I've learned from my computer at, oh crap. Oh, cred, the, um, at school, it only works if you're in presentation mode, but if you click on the image, it does this. So that's actually a partridge call. And I say to kids, I'm so sorry. I couldn't get the sound of a pear tree in there, but I tried. Ha ha ha. Okay. I hear the turtle doves. And again, kids might go like, I know that sound. I've heard that. Some of them. Some kids might say that, but actually they haven't. Okay. Um, this one's really fun. The calling bird. It was originally Collie bird, which is a, a black bird, but... Oh, rats. Let's see if I can get it. That's a fun sound for them. They usually don't know. The rings is it? I cheated on this one. Someone dropped the rings. Geese. So they're all, all um, just sort of those versions of that sound, all traditional sounds, except for like the Lord's leaping. I cheated on that one too. Here are the Hyper's piping. 
So that's actually a bagpipe. So if you showed that image of the bagpipe before, now they can uh, put the sound with the picture. And a drum <laughs> drum line. So it's sort of fun to give a little bit more context of, of you know, what those things are um, if you're going to teach kids about those things. So that's sort of how I do the 12 days. Um, and like I said, I'm going to include um, the book this year with younger grades. And then um, I'll, I'll use that PowerPoint when we actually teach it. And then I do teach it and we do sing along. And then I use that PowerPoint as a guide to help us sort of get through. Um, it's better if you do the song more than once. So if you could do, if you see them one kit one time and then you could pull it again at the next class period, it's great to do that um, because then the first time through, they're still just sort of getting and understanding and learning all of it. And the second time through, they can, they can just sing it and they have fun with it. And it's really fun if you have like a, a clicker or something that a kid can be the one who advances the slides. I always play along at the piano. I'm comfortable with that, but maybe not everyone is. I'm sure you could find a really cool recording or just sing a cappella. It's, it's a really great song. I also did a favorite folk song set or actually a favorite carol set um, for this to explain some of the vocabulary to explain what the 12 days really were when that happens is actually the 12 days starting on Christmas Day that lead to January 6th which is traditionally epiphany but we don't have to get into that with kids but you can but um, all of that is in the the favorite carol set if you're interested in that to give a little more context um, I wanted to talk like so super briefly about um, the Nutcracker uh, because I've talked, I know before in other videos and um, many other times about Nutcrackers. I love that super huge collection at school. Um, but a couple resources that I'm throwing in this year that are a little bit um, newer. Um, for some grades, I have this really great cutout book, um, uh, The Nutcracker, and this is, uh, it's an Usborne book, and it is by um, Anna Milborn, illustrated by James, or sorry, Carl's James Mountford. Um, and it's a super cool, just beautiful retelling of this story. Got this from my friend Karen. It's just so great. She found it through her Usborne friend who sells Usborne books. Um, but that's just a really great book if you wanted to show that um, to your younger kids. It's really intriguing. We usually start telling the Nutcracker story in first or second grade. And then we do some really cool lessons um, around the Nutcracker, around music from the Nutcracker that they often hear around Christmas time, but they don't always know what it is. Um, and so, like, for instance, I'll do um, a movement lesson with... Um, the march, the dun 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 dun. dun. I shared about that on a podcast a couple years ago. Um, the whole lesson plan for that, if you're interested. Um, I also do a version of a scarf move, or not scarf, a ribbon wand movement that I think I found in Artie Almeida's book Mallet Madness, um, based on the the trepec. The there's a really cool version of that. Um, some things I'm adding this year. Um, there's this great book that I shared about a couple weeks ago uh, called Duke Ellington's Nutcracker Suite, and it tells the story of why. Um, well, first of all, it tells who Duke Ellington is, and then it talks about why he did of the Nutcracker, um, why he created his own, and it's just really cool. It has beautiful pictures. Um, the storyline is really interesting. This would be great if you have to take a day, like you do, you know, a holiday chorus tour like I do, or if you had to do, you know, some other reason to get away. This is a great thing to leave uh, for a sub. It'd be great for them to read through, and then they could play some of the music. Um, it, it'd be a great addition um, if you wanted to go a little bit non-traditional with the story. If you wanted to stay traditional with the story, this book by uh, Susan Jeffers is a really great retelling with images uh, that link to the ballet. Um, so, for instance, they, there's a lot of dancing, a lot of imagery that sort of looks um, like the ballet that maybe would come up. Uh, let's see if I can find my favorite page when they go to see the snowflakes. The snowflakes look like they're wearing tutus. So that's super cool to get that sort of imagery in your student's head early. So this is a great book to have around. That's by Susan Jeffers. That's um, also on the links page. And then I'm also going to include this one called The Nutcracker in Harlem. And I shared about this a couple weeks ago. But this is a nut. It's basically the Nutcracker story just retold as if it was happening in Harlem. Um, and uh, Marie is still Marie and um, that most of the characters are still the same. Her uncle is not called Drosselmeyer. He's not called Uncle Cab, but she does get a nutcracker. Um, there is, you know, the sort of toy soldiers involved and there's a story of the mouse. They don't go to the land of the sweets, but um, it is, it is very close to the original part of the story. Um, and so it's, it's fun to bring this one in too. 
it gives sort of another version of the Nutcracker to students. So this is one I'm going to have um, and use this season. But I wanted to show you really quickly what I do when I show the Nutcracker to students because the very first year I tried doing that, I just like started it and was like, well, we'll see. And then like, of course, they were restless. They didn't know what was happening. Um, they, they, they couldn't they couldn't connect with the story. So I wanted to show you and explain just a little bit about what I did um, as sort of commentary. So again, I'm so sorry. I'm going to try and get my screen uh, to show my computer one last time and sort of show you what I might do if I were showing this to students. Oh, sorry, Facebook. Okay. This is the 45th video live Monday, musical Mondays video that I've tried to oh oh that did not work that I've tried to do and still I'm not I'm I've not got the technology down perfect so I am so very sorry I'm trying to zoom in but it doesn't want oh there we go okay too far Woo! all right I'm just gonna go for it so um let me pull up the video this is this is a and this is safeshare.tv you've heard me talk about it but um, instead of using YouTube, I use this so that um, it when, when you load it up, it doesn't have any pop-up ads. It doesn't have any ads on the side. You can see the sides are completely bare. Whereas if I showed them the YouTube version, if I didn't have it in this, um, this big mode, it would have all these other videos and things on the side and ads and whatever else. So if I use safeshare.tv, it, it takes all of that away. But um, I just want to sort of explain sort of what I do when I teach this lesson. So this is the Sugar Plum Fairy scene. And again, because if I showed that book from before, kids are sort of prepped for what um, this is going to look like. I let them watch for just a second. So if you're listening on the podcast, it's the ballerina. <laughs> She's dancing around. But one of the things that I say to students is, you know, ballerinas work really, really, really hard. They have to work years and years and years to, you know, be as graceful and as gentle as they are on stage. And if you watch, she's jumping around, she's walking on the very tips of her toes, which is actually really, really hard to do. And she makes it look so simple and graceful. And when she walks on the tips of her toes, she actually has special shoes that she wears. Now she does have to practice many years to be very, very good and able to do this. And her legs have to be so strong to be able to do that. If you try to do it, you'd probably hurt your leg or fall over, but she's worked so very hard for a very long time and the shoes do help a little. And oh my gosh, look, she's spinning and spinning and spinning and she's doing the splits and things with just one leg on the ground. That's crazy. She's so flexible and has worked very hard to be able to do this oh and right away I, I always have to mention because the kids will start giggling I'll say oh you see how her it looks like her skirt has come up that that's on purpose the ballerinas work for years and years and years to be this graceful and gentle and to be able to uh, move like this and if they wore a long dress or or something like that it would cover up all the great work that they're doing with their feet and their legs and the splits and the jumps and you wouldn't see it and so ballerinas wear tights underneath their to this well skirt it's called a tutu they wear it on purpose so that you don't see anything inappropriate but you can still see their legs and feet moving it's sort of like a bathing suit and tights but they wear it underneath their tutu and that sort of dispels some of the giggles not always but again guess what this is real life so we're just we're just showing them that and explaining and hoping it, it's not a big deal. Then I say, oh, this is my favorite part because not only can ballerinas dance and be gentle and be smooth, but watch. She spins and spins and spins and not once does she get sick and not once does she fall over. Sometimes the kids make me go back so they can count how many times she spins. Oh. And I wonder if she's going to get dizzy and fall over at the end. No, she land she stopped and landed exactly where she meant to. It's because she's worked so hard for years and years and years to be able to do that. And so she has, she's been, she's so good at it that now she's able to do it without having any problems. So that was a version, um, 
I'm not exactly sure which nutcracker that was that, oh gosh, now I gotta zoom out here. Um, that was, that was just a YouTube version so I could show you on this video today. But um, the version of the nutcracker that I show to my students, um, it's, I think it's the BBC, it's the Royal Opera, Royal Ballet. Um, and I, I put that link on the links page of which one I use. Um, but uh, that, I just want to show you sort of the process of, of what I explain. I don't always do that for uh, that much for all of the, the videos. And I don't show the whole thing. I only show selections. But I show the Sugar Plum Fairy. I show the, the, um, the Battle of the Rats. I show uh, certain things that I know are important or maybe the songs that kids will understand and will hear in other places. But I do give commentary and overlay because if you just have them sit and try and watch, it's very, very tricky for even the, your best students to be able to give the attention for that. So giving them things to look for, giving them different um, aspects of the story to, uh, to catch on to, that's really important. Okay, I hope this was helpful that you're able to see a lot of different lessons that you could use in December, some resources and ideas of how you might use them. Um, if you are interested, uh, starting tonight, I'm doing a giveaway with uh, five books. Um, the giveaway is with um, the 12 Days of Christmas book I talked about. You can find that on the links page. The Nutcracker by Susan Jeffers, Nutcracker in Harlem by uh, T.E. McMorrow, and also uh, Walking in Winter Wonderland illustrated by Tim Hopgood. I'm giving all those away. The giveaway runs through Wednesday at midnight. You can find that links to that on the links page. Also, I'm not coming back next week. I'm taking my uh, winter break. I'll see you back in January. And there is a survey um, if you'd be willing to take that on the links page as well. Uh, thanks so much for coming along and watching everyone. I hope these last 15 weeks have been really helpful um, and I appreciate you spending the time with me. And maybe Instagram's going to show up, maybe not. Facebook, thanks so much for coming along. Like I said, on the links page, there are all of those resources and I'd really appreciate if you would uh, do the survey if you're willing. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night.